All right, so it's about 12.02, so we're just wanting to get started. Um, my name is Ariel, and folks call me Erin, and I'm one of the associates here at C4. I use she, her, her pronouns, and I'm really excited for y'all to be here. It's going to be a centered conversation and discussion about putting the fun back into fun development. We know that's really important during these times and always. Um, so after the panelists introduce themselves, Bean is going to go in and talk about some technical things, but I will turn it over to Laura to introduce herself first. Great. Thanks, Erin. Hi, everyone. My name is Laura Gillis. I'm a senior advisor with, the, um, with C4 Innovations. Um, I've done a lot of work around fund development over the years, either leading organizations, sitting on nonprofit boards, writing lots of federal grants and other grants, and I'm looking for and events, and I'm looking forward to talking with you all about it. Thanks, Laura. Hi, everybody. My name is Kristen Harper, and I'm a recovery specialist at C4 Innovations. So I have the opportunity to work with this amazing staff. I've had a variety of different roles in nonprofit sectors over the years. I've been an executive director for a local nonprofit in North Carolina, and then also a national nonprofit. Um, so I, as executive director, played a big role in fund development and fundraising, and I'm really excited to talk to you about some of my lessons learned uh, and things I wish I knew when I first got started as an ED. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Bina. I am an assistant at C4, and I am will I will be providing some tech support for this event today. Um, if you haven't done so already, please type your name in the chat and tell us where you are from. For most of this presentation today, you will be your audio will be muted upon entry, and we encourage you not to start your camera during this presentation. To have the best video experience, we encourage folks to change your gallery view to speaker view. And you can do that by hovering over to the right hand corner in the larger meeting room and you'll switch from gallery view to speaker view. And I assume there are folks who are not joining themselves on camera. And if you don't want to see folks who are not on camera and just exclusively the presenters, I would recommend you hovering over to your video and click on the three dots um, located in the right hand corner and scroll down to the menu of options till you see the high non-video participants. And if you would like to make any changes to your name, um, you can go to manage participants, hover over to hover over to your um, to the three dots on the on your name, then change to rename. Um, thank you so much. All right. So this is the work that C4 really centers itself around. If you want to connect more with us, please visit our website, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, at the end of this, um, Laura and Kristen doing a wonderful presentation and interactive event, we will have green room space for about 30 minutes where you can stay on and get turn your video on as well and really connect with them deeper and connect. Kristen actually has to hop off, so you'll just get one-on-one -on -one time with Laura, which is always a good time. And yes, please, please, we want this to be interactive as possible. So utilize the chat, seeing how all attendees are gonna be muted. That's the best way for your questions, concerns, feedback to be heard. Um, so definitely just utilize that space. And without any further ado, I'm just gonna turn over to Laura and Kristen. Thank you so much, Air. Um, I have to say, I've been really looking forward to this particular presentation. Uh, because um, fund development for me over the past 15 years or so being in nonprofit work is one of those areas that I feel like I had to sort of conquer. I came into the nonprofit world a bit anxious about the word fund development and fundraising. And so some of the information that we're going to share here has really helped me um, develop as a development person. Um, also, I feel like the title in itself is something that we really want to keep in mind. So how do we make this fun? Um, how do we make, you know, especially in 2020 with COVID and an assortment of other issues happening this year, how can we pivot as nonprofit leaders and really make sure that we're hitting the mark? So just quickly, I want to just review a couple of foundational elements that are just best practices for nonprofits. When you're building your fundamental components for successful fund development, it's important to remember these five elements. And I compare them to 
um, air, earth, water, fire, um, and I'm excited to kind of go into a little bit more detail with a few of them, but not spend too much time on it, because we really want to have a discussion uh, with you all and between Laura and I on some of our examples and um, things that we've learned over the years. So this is a really fun area for me that I found over the years is recruit recruitment of board, uh, board members for board of directors and then also board cultivation. Um, this can be really exciting. It can also be very depressing <laughs> depending on how you decide to approach your board development. So really what goes into board development initially is really you want to define your board identity. So really have a clear understanding of the role that your board is gonna play in fund development and just an overall support of your organization. So if you need some additional support within uh, this particular sector, we actually offer a separate training just for uh, engaging board of directors. So be happy to work with you on that, but this is an incredibly important piece of fund development. Obviously, effective communications and marketing is huge. So if you do not have a strategic marketing plan or messaging plan that is very clear uh, to the general public, that can be a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. um, one that I learned um, early on in my career working in the nonprofit recovery space was we're very jargon heavy within the recovery community. So we had to learn how to make certain elements very user friendly, so to speak. Um, and so I encourage you to think about how you can turn some of your very specific jargon heavy language into more um, general language so that the uh, public can be receptive to it. Motivated and professional staff is another key element uh, that matches uh, a lot of what you're doing with your board development, you're also going to want to do talent management and really cultivate your staff so that they understand their roles as well with fund development and within the organization itself. Um, and I think that just which match and fit nicely with the other puzzle pieces of your nonprofit um, roles and responsibilities can be very helpful with staff. Nobody wants a staff that's confused about their roles. It can be very frustrating and it can uh, really bring the organization down. And then finally, strategic approaches for funding. This is what we're gonna spend the most time on today is talking about diversified funding approaches, the benefits of hosting fundraising versus uh, really a fund development approach. Also, you know, we all love doing events, but are they really beneficial to your bottom line? Uh, donor and funder relationship management cultivation and talking about creating a balanced portfolio for funding sources. Um, and then we're also going to get into a little bit of what I mentioned at the beginning of the hour of how are we pivoting during COVID? Uh, what are we looking towards as far as virtual fundraising, digital fundraising, and maybe thinking outside of the box this year? Mm -hmm. Laura. Oh, thanks, Kristen. Um, before I go into this, I just want to ask you all, um, the chat box is on the bottom of your screen. Give us your questions, anything, uh, anything you want to ask us about fund development or fundraising. Um, just put it into the chat box because uh, Kristen and I don't want to be talking heads up here. We really want to communicate with you. And um, it's a lot more fun for us around fund development if we can respond to what your needs are and what you want to hear about. So um, just you know, put, the, put your questions in that chat box. So one of the things about fund development versus fundraising, the way that, that I think about it and, and the way that it's written a lot um, in the, around fund development um, professionals is that fund development is really about the long term. It goes back to what Christian was saying about who, what is the board roles and responsibilities? What is the staff? Who you have? Um, what is your fundraising plan? It's really thinking in the long term, like anything is in development. I mean, we go through developmental stages of life. Well, it's kind of like that. You are, you're planning for the long term. Fundraising is like, what are we doing like in the next month, the next two months to raise money now, which could be, um, let's have a birthday fundraiser for our organization on Facebook and let's get that up and running so that we can, you know, pull some, some money in right now. 
So that's really the big difference between fund development and fundraising. Um, and we just wanted to um, make that distinction because you'll see that uh, people will talk about it differently. And so we want to just talk about that. So now we're going to, as you can see, get rid of our PowerPoint because we're ready for questions. <laughs> um, so, oh, good. Air's back. We need you, Air. Yeah, uh, so I just was putting one in the chat box. And the question I'm also going to ask for all of, with, for the two of you as well, is how, do you have any stories or good ideas on how to take events virtually right now? Yeah, Laura, do you want to, I know you have a really great example of a recent virtual fundraiser and then I well, can. I, yeah, I was a participant in a recent. Yeah. Event. Okay, so I live in Baltimore, Maryland. That's where I am right now. And um, Marion House, which is, um, it's a, uh, it's an organization that particularly caters to women and children who have been homeless. And so they've been doing a 5K for years. And I have a very good friend who's a supporter of Marion House. And of course, with the 5K, people aren't doing 5Ks anymore. So they, they went virtual with their event. And the way that they did it was that they asked people to do the run, the 5K, across a whole week. So you can think about it, it's like a little over three miles. And so my very good friend, Annie, has, her husband is 95 years old. And so she decided to call it the Bob Audacious Team. And so she created the Bob Audacious Team. She sent an email out to all of her friends and said, um, Bob, Bob wants to support uh, Marion House. He's going to do a 5K over this next week. And so Bob with his walker did a little bit every single day. And she would send out reminder emails to us saying, Bob just did, you know, he just walked half a mile today with his walker. And so then at the end, for Bob's last little part of his walk, we all met in a park, of course, distance with our masks on as Bob was finishing the last of his walk. So it was, they raised about $2,500 just through their friends um, for, for the Marion House through the Bob Audacious team. And it was just a really clever way, one for Marion House to take their 5K virtually, but also for one of their donors, who is my friend Annie, to bring in her friends and ask her friends to support. Because one of the things that's the basic tenet of fundraising is that people give to people. They don't give to organizations. They give to people that they know because it's all relationship-based. Right. That's such a great point, Laura. Thank you for bringing that up. That really takes me back to uh, our conversation about fund development and strategically planning over a year or a quarter and then going back to see if you've met your goals for fund development and fundraising during those time periods. And um, there is a terminology in fund development um, that's called you know, donor cultivation or repeat givers. So if you already have a donor base that you're working with, you could do some really fun stuff virtually. Um, like Laura just brought up, the peer-to-peer -peer outreach. We know that one in four um, peer-to-peer outreaches actually result in a donation, which is better than like, I think it's 35% of just a massive email blast asking for donations uh, only returns. I mean, still 35% isn't terrible, but it's not as good as one in four. So I think that peer-to-peer, that, -peer, that relationship building piece is so critical. Mm -hmm. um, and then at that point, when you do have a pretty good donor base, you can do fun stuff like what we did a couple of years ago for a Christmas fundraiser is we did an online auction. And this was even pre-COVID. We did online auction uh, for folks that were supporting us from around the country, which is great. So you don't have to just focus on local donors, but you can pull in other people that want to support you and support your mission. And doing an online auction um, can be a really fun way to do that. Mm -hmm. And you can incorporate, depending on you know, your target audience for this. You can incorporate fun game activities into that online auction. You could do like a paint and sip where, you know, folks get together, do something creative and just sip and chat and network and stuff. Um, and then also making sure that you collect any new contacts that participate in those virtual events because it is also all about the contacts too. Oh yeah, that's definitely true. 
Definitely. And so part of that, right, is just getting comfortable, one, with asking for money, which is so not comfortable. <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful <laughs> that I, I have other people in my life that feel more comfortable doing this, but this is an important part of it. And especially we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago about mm -hmm. just working in this field and being such a mission driven not only just person, but in true service, whatever organiz organization you're working at, but how do we, um, as folks that are doing this work, get over the, the ask, the fear of the ask, right? The trust in that person to person. Do you have any suggestions for folks on that? Yeah, I, I remember I, I used to, I used to, when I was younger, I used to hate to ask people for money. And because I, because I just, like you're saying here, I just immediately went, oh no, no, I can't do this. But what I've learned over the years is this, is that number one, when you are excited about your mission and about the organization that you represent, that you're asking the support for, the funding for, it's so much easier to make the ask because that excitement comes through to the person that you're asking. That's one. Two, so that's the, the personal part. And the other one is be okay with no. Be all right with no. The second thing is, is that start with people that you know. So start with, for an organization, start with your staff and your board, and then grow that circle out. As Kristen just mentioned, it's much better to ask people who you have a relationship with than to ask strangers, okay? And so that's kind of another fun, to, fun development tenet is to start here and then ask out. Plus, if your board's giving money, that's one of the things that funders always want to know. Is your board supporting you? And, you know, in a lot of grant applications, and I'm sure a lot of you who are with us today have written grants where you wrote 100% of our board participates because funders want to see that. It's important because it's like, if they're not supporting you, why should I, right? So, so that's that piece. The other, um, so those are the ones that I think of immediately. Kristen, what else, what else you want to add to that? Yeah. I mean, Laura, do you love puppies and babies? Yeah. <laughs> right. So that's kind of a joke that we have in the fundraising world is if you can incorporate puppies and babies, then your money, right? right. So in a way, in a way that's true, right? Because everybody feels an automatic connection to, you know, this empathy for animals and for children. Yeah. And so I think that when we're crafting an elevator speech or messaging for our organization that's related to our mission, I, over the years, have really grown to love to ask people for money because it's going to enable us to accomplish this great work, right? And it's going to help those that are giving the money be part of that work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of the major donors that I've worked with over the years, that's really what is most meaningful to them is that they want to feel like they're giving back, they're a part of this amazing work, and they want to see outcomes. And so the more outcomes, the more stories we could share, uh, the more testimonies. Um, if we have something we can actually point to as far as brick and mortar, that's very exciting, you know, and just keeping that energy up and just telling them, don't you want to be a part of this really fantastic work? And finding out what their goals are as well as potential donors, finding out what they're interested in, because they may not be interested at all in our mission. We have to make sure that we're doing our research beforehand to target the right potential donors as well. No, that is so important. And the other thing too that I've learned is that, um, and now that I'm older, this is true for me too, is um, people want the opportunity to participate. And I have literally have, have had people, particularly over the last six months with COVID, ask me to do things. And I say to them, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you for reaching out to me and giving me the opportunity to do this. So that's the other part of it too. You're giving people the opportunity to support um, your organization. Absolutely. And thank you for that too, because even when you are asking for money and you're going to that same person over and over and it's like, well, that's all you see me as and you don't want to do that, we know. And mm -hmm. so Danielle dropped a great question that I know y'all can help us out with is, we have a very loyal donor base, but do you have any advice on how to grow the donor base so we don't exhaust or turn off our constant donors? Um, they've been able to raise and 
have some fundraisers during the pandemic, but want to be mindful of that. Any advice? Yeah. Well, I, one that immediately comes to my mind is what my, ex, my example of Annie, because Annie reached out to her circle of friends. Marion House now has me as one of their donors that they didn't have before. So she expanded their donor base as a donor to them because, because they suggested that people create teams. I think I left that out of my story, sorry. They suggested that people create teams so that, and that was a smart move for them because they are expanding their donor base. Now they have more emails, more information. So that is one, because then you're building on your success. I'm also a big fan of um, collaborations and partnerships. Yes. And I think that that's a really great way to kind of get your brand, your mission, um, your folks out there. So if there are other organizations that are, say, cousin or organizations may not be completely uh, doing the same work, but in the same sort of ballpark, mm -hmm. um, doing some kind of partnership outreach with them can be super helpful. And then also doing a regular either quarterly or annual sort of asset mapping. I'm like the queen of asset mapping. So just looking at what you have available in your local area and also in your target market um, and just understanding are there new organizations, are there new potential um, faith-based organizations, parent organizations, depending on your mission that you could do outreach to. Also getting involved with like a city council commission or some kind of local organization, Kiwanis Club, that's also a really great way to sort of stay kind of in the network uh, and keep your, your brand out there and your organization out there, along with joining any sort of nonprofit um, association, either statewide or locally as well. Yeah. Yeah. And what I'm hearing you say and all that is networking. Yeah. Big time. The whole thing of networking of being, you know, being on different boards and, and as executive directors, be on the board of someplace else. You'll learn a lot about how other organizations run. That's really helpful to you, but you also expand your fund development opportunities. Mm -hmm. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice. And so we have another question from Chris. Any suggestions for sectors that are really saturated already? So you can think about that demographically, whatever the program outcomes you're trying. Like, it's hard to find your niche if you're the new kid on the block, right? Um, so how do you get your foot in the door when potential funders support the field in other ways already? How do you make yourself unique, I guess? Mm, as well. Good question. Yeah, we went through this big time when I was um, with the national nonprofit. It's interesting because there's different levels of um, donor bases and funding opportunities, whether you're at a local county, city, state, or nationally. And so really understanding the landscape of the philanthropy scene at whatever level you're at is critical. So at the national level, within our recovery community space, which is where we were um, really kind of fighting for space, it was very saturated and there was a limited amount of national um, funders who were interested in continuing to support recovery related uh, topics. So what we had to do is we actually did a national scan of pockets in various communities across the country that mm. we felt like were gonna be worth an investment um, of outreach for uh, fund development purposes. So if you have the bandwidth and the staff to do that, I suggest, you know, looking at, there's public records of, you know, particular populations. We know Connecticut is a pretty um, wealthy community, Southern California, but then also looking at where are a lot of the donors located throughout the country, depending on your mission and your target population. Um, that does take a little bit of work to do. It can be worth it. And then hosting some kind of event or outreach or trying to build contacts and network in those areas um, can prove to be very helpful. Also, if you're a local community and you feel like the area is saturated, then just sort of taking a step back and seeing what are others doing that you can do something different. So just trying to think about out of the box approaches uh, to your fund development and to your outreach and continuing that relationship building as well. Yeah. Yeah, those, those are all, that's really good. The other thing I was thinking about, um, I don't have a particular example in my personal, but I was thinking about um, the whole networking. I worked in homeless services for years and did national work and, and here in Baltimore in the state. 
and I know that um, there's competition, you know, for those dollars. And I'm thinking about the times that we, when I was at Healthcare for the Homeless here in Baltimore, we partnered with other homeless organizations to do fundraising events. Um, and so, and they already had a really good reputation. So that helped our reputation, made us more credible as new, new kids on the block. And then we could peel off later and do something ourselves. So that's almost a way to kind of get your foot in the door. Yeah, and then bragging about it, right? I think right. If anytime you can get the media involved or share your stories on your website, uh, make little miniature vignettes of folks that you are supporting, put them on your website. Yep. I'm not a huge fan of newsletters because I feel like everybody is super spammed <laughs> with newsletters, but just some kind of regular update. Uh, either on your social media platform or um, something like that, uh, just to get your stories out there to kind of stay in the spotlight can be helpful too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I want to kind of go back to something that you talked about in the beginning, Kristen, and also Laura was talking about this as well, the importance of your board being involved. Uh, yeah. How do you navigate that? We all know, we have, we've all had those experiences where the board has not been able to um, be involved in the same way, you know? And so, so any suggestions for that? You know what, you all, I'm wondering if this is the time for our poll. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> We have a surprise, you all. Great minds. We we want to we want to ask you a question. So we're going to bring a poll in, and we're going to ask you to um, answer. You know, uh, all of the it's a multiple choice. So you can answer several several different things, and Bina's going to bring it in for us in just a second. And it's about um, the role of the board versus the role of the executive director, which goes to the heart of your question, here. So give us a vote right now, you all that are on the phone. What do you see as the board's role? Can you click on this and then we can see? We'll give you a few minutes to go through these. Click all that apply. Oh well, yeah, people are clicking away. We can see it in real time. I love that. It is important to differentiate between the board's role and the staff's role. It's really a really, really important thing to do. And again, Laura, I think, you know, my biggest kind of learning curve with, uh, with both of the boards that I worked with and now mm -hmm. when I do consulting work with various boards that I work with is really this idea of board identity. It's critical is understanding, you know, who does the board want to be? What are they bringing to the table yes. as a nonprofit? Because it, as an executive director and as a board member of some other nonprofits, but as the executive director, it was always very frustrating when we felt confused about the roles of board members versus the ED. So um, not having a clearly defined mission and vision for the board specifically can lead to a lot of trouble. Right. Yeah, you asked about what is the difference between identifying prospective donors and cultivating? Identifying is a little bit what Kristen was saying earlier when she was saying that she was looking for donors in a saturated market and doing that kind of like out there really, you know, scooping out what's going on versus cultivating is the other question that um, someone asked earlier about, I have these donors, I want to expand. And there was a part of that is like cultivating current donors to help you expand. It's really so, about building that relationship, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, making sure yeah. that that's a good fit and taking right. care of them yeah and I think it's like the same thing when you think about cultivating the board right it's like yeah. the same idea if you start there there's some I've been offered opportunities to work at organizations but I look at their board and the relationship in those spaces and I'm like I, I know I'll be I won't be able to do that as an ED or I won't be able to get behind that or how active is the board what are they up to and that matters that matters as soon as you're starting the organization on how you're able to recruit prospective donors, staff, making sure that they're automatically already in line with the mission and are offering something and feeding into it. Because mm -hmm. uh, they have the last say, right? Oftentimes, right? They, exactly, they say, right? exactly. So. These so, are really interesting results too, I think, to the poll, if everybody can see these. Um, I'm a big believer that each board member should commit to giving a certain amount annually to the organization. 
Um, and that's what we call proud giving. So that would be a minimum amount that the board members agree, you know, $250 to $10,000 a year. Um, and just having board members to go out into the community and while they're trying to cultivate or help you identify prospective donors, understanding that that's part of it, that potential board members need to be able to have the capacity to donate themselves can be very helpful. Yep. And, and one of the things about that too is that I've been on boards where we've had folks on the board who were great community organizers, really important and valuable perspectives who didn't have a lot of resources. And so we didn't set a value of what board had to give. We just said everyone had to give. And I have been on boards where someone gave $5. And that was fine because they were giving their volunteer hours and their perspective and their networking right. to that organization. And that meant a heck of a lot for us. Yeah. And it really, it, it goes back to the strengths of your organization. Because if your executive director or your senior staff has a lot of background in fund development and diversified funding streams, then your board can be uh, more of a working board, volunteer board. Uh, community, you know, connecting you, networking board. But if your staff and your organization is relatively new, then you would want to have a pretty, a fairly strong um, board of directors that could help mm -hmm. give you some of that initial seed funding to get your organization off the ground. Right. So, in looking at all of these, um, the the uh, the proud giving, um, the uh, understanding the fundraising program is very important because the board's number one responsibility in any organization is, is resources. It's raising money. That's number one that any, anyone who sits on a nonprofit board, that's your number one thing that you're responsible for. And so ensuring that fundraising has adequate resources, that's critical. And that's an important board role. Okay. So are we ready to go to the other one? We have another poll you all. So if you end that poll, and let's look at what's the role, now let's, let's look at this in relationship, what is the role of the executive director? You know, let's look at this, what's the difference then? So all of you, take this poll for us. What do you see as the, um, the roles of the executive director? Let's take a minute and, and answer that poll. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you all for answering. This looks great. Yep. Okay. Number one is heading up strategic planning, program evaluation, generating operational supports. Yep. That's pretty much one of the major roles of an executive director. Kristen, do you want to comment on any of this? Um, I think that just to fit in with that particular one you touched on is also understanding your role on the fiscal oversight with the board. We haven't really talked about yeah. that role that the board takes on as well. Yeah. So they are the governing body of the nonprofit traditionally. So the executive director will work very closely on annual audits, those types of things, which also will play into fund development as well. That's where you'll pull in uh, your strategic planning section and yeah. your target goals for the year. And you want to make sure that your board helps you uh, create those right and that goes back to that definition that we were doing earlier about fund development versus fundraising tying your fund development goals to your strategic plan as Kristen was just saying is really that's the long-term planning piece yeah 
And the way to make that fun, going back to the title <laughs> of this, I have to say that um, one of the best weekends I had with the nonprofit in North Carolina, so we did a board retreat at a beautiful um, uh, uh, faith-based uh, camp area. I don't even, I guess it was called a retreat, um, but we had a lot of a, a really good time, both accomplishing our strategic planning goals, but then also really bonding as a board and an organization, playing games, having dinners together. So there is a way to make strategic planning and your fun development uh, planning fun. So it's not just in the office with a bulletin board taking notes all the time. It can be fun. Yeah. Agree. Okay. All right. Should we stop sharing? Okay. Click that off. We have another question. What are some effective strategies and ways or advice to engage younger audiences to give? So example, young professionals, millennials, it's a whole different ball game when we're looking at it from that lens. Yeah, and that came from my friend, Celine. Hi, Celine, I'm so glad to see you in the room. Um, and Celine defines fun millennial, just if y'all don't know her, she's fantastic. So <laughs> yeah, so I think that um, the research that I've been reading on this particular topic is millennials really love match uh, programs. Mm -hmm. So understanding that if you're going to put out maybe like a, a one day drive to raise uh, funds for a specific purpose, that you secure match funding to go with it. And that could be from one of your uh, loyal donors or uh, a corporate organization, grocery store, restaurants. There's a lot of different ways to do match programs. But when I understand, millennials really like to see uh, others match their donations. Yep. And I was thinking using social media mm -hmm. um, is a way to, to really reach that population um, through either Facebook. I mentioned raising money for birthdays online, but also Instagram. And you can raise money that way through that, that whole venue. Mm -hmm. Also, I guess as a millennial, which is so weird to think of me that way, because I'm like at the end of it, just a little, mm -hmm. uh, I think some of it, it doesn't have to change. I'm grateful to be raised really old school where we send out thank you letters and it's really about building that relationship. But I will say, I think you know, my generation and, and, and younger folks want to feel like they have an influence. So some of the stuff that y'all already said, like making sure donors feel like they have a responsibility, you know, to feel a part of, to make sure that they have a voice in, in the organization is just as important with young people because oftentimes it's just like, oh, they're just millennials. And clearly they, they, they are more than that. They're, they're really wanting to um, be of service and be a part of something bigger than themselves. Totally. Such a great point, Aria. Thank you. I, I think we've had a lot of really great luck over the years with actually with the peer to peer giving. So having young people um, either drive campaigns or do one on one outreach. Um, if you have the, the ability to tap into young people as a network, um, they're phenomenal at, at helping uh, just with the capacity of an organization. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All right, I'm still looking for any questions. Feel free to add some more into the chat, but we will go with another one. So in the idea, usually we have deliverables, we have somebody to answer to, we have strategic plans, and fund development is a part of that work, right? A part of that visioning. How do you measure success? Like, when will you know that you've done a great job um, or that you're on the right track? Um, what are some ways that you've both learn to measure success, even outside of just the number hit, right? Yeah. Well, obviously the one is that you raise some money. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. But, but the other is um, how many donors that you have now that you, that are you growing your donor base? And then also, are you expanding it? it but like if you analyze the, your donor data, are you, are you expanding it from just one group into other groups. That's another way to measure success. Um, did you meet the goals that you set in your fundraising plan? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, th I'm, that's what else coming up to my mind this second, Kristen. What else you got? Yeah, so again, I'm really big on the relationship building piece. And so I think if you're tracking either with some kind of um, donor database or contact list or Salesforce, something like that. I, you know, you could set some deliverables around, you know, how many new contacts you have created, 
Um, you could also, we've set some monetary goals, some fiscal goals around um, certain percentages need to come in annually through donors, other percentages come in through grants uh, right. and other fundraising opportunities. I will say just a word of caution on event planning. So if you're going to include events in your fund development plan over the year, you really want to have a very clear deliverable on what you consider to be a success for your events. Mm. Um, over the years, I've learned some pretty hard lessons with events. And one just comes to the top of my mind is uh, this thing we did called the Haunted Forest, uh, which was really fun. It was fantastic. It was a great way for us to get our name and our mission out into the community. Uh, we brought in about $20,000, which sounds great, but <laughs> we also had to staff an entire haunted forest for five nights throughout Halloween. And so we had about 300 volunteers. And I think at the end of the day, when we added up all the, the man and woman powers that, that went into this event, we actually probably should have brought in like $80,000 to really have come uh, full circle and make a lot of money off of it. So just understanding, I think, when you're moving forward with strategic planning and setting your fundraising goals, you know, maybe not overwhelming your organization because it does take a lot of human capital to put on events. Um, and what is your bottom line? Is it to get your name out there to attract new donors, to attract new contacts and collaborations, or do you really feel like uh, it's an event that will bring in a lot of money? There is one of my favorite events in Houston, Texas that I used to go to every year before this year. Uh, it raises about $200,000. It's one luncheon, it lasts for two and a half hours, but they've been doing it for 10 years. And so they were able to build up a really great invitation list. Uh, it's at the, the nicest golf club uh, golf course in Houston, and they really were able to uh, beef up their invitation list to be able to produce that kind of money. That event is obviously worth the effort because uh, they're bringing in some big funds with that. Yeah. I wanted to add about events too. I, I've had a few horror stories about events as well. And what I learned is that um, you have to get everything when you're setting your budget for your event, which is kind of you're, you're thinking about when we were talking about measuring, you know, success is setting that budget. You have to get as much free as possible. And I had the uh, unfortunate, I had this great event in Baltimore for uh, homeless services and had a great group working. And at the bottom line, we didn't, we made no money. And the reason, because we, I didn't set the budget up correctly. And I had too many expenses over cost over how much revenue we brought in. So I highly recommend is like Krista mentioned this earlier, have a, a media partner with you that can advertise the event. So you're not spending any money for advertising, get sponsors who are sponsoring before you even start, make sure you have sponsorships that are, you know, corporations and things that are going to be giving you money to sponsor the event. And then the staffing, Krista mentioned this, it's so important. How many staff are involved and what is the number of hours, labor hours that you really think you're going to have? Think about that before you embark on the event. Um, and, and then project, given what you're asking people to give you, a ticket or whatever it is, project what you think you're going to get and then do a cost benefit analysis. Is this worth it? Is this worth it? Um, Events, usually the first time that you don't make a lot of money, but as Kristen just mentioned, over time, you, you, it becomes a brand. People start to know it. Like, cause you're in North Carolina and you're driving over to Houston for this event. Yeah. Well, I would be flying normally, okay. <laughs> but okay. yeah, I mean, and the other thing that's so special that, about that particular event is that they really incorporate into the luncheon, right? It's a huge luncheon. It's so it's it's not just round tables with nice, you know, settings and flowers and stuff. They have letters written from the students on the table for us to look wow. at. They have photography that the students have collected over the year for us to feel inspired by. So I think that they've really created this sort of um, culture around yeah. the mission that pulls in the students that they are affecting on a daily basis as much as possible. And of course, the speakers that they have are always really powerful because they're students and they share the story of the good work that the organization has been doing. That's great. 
So we've been doing a little bit of storytelling, which is my favorite way to learn. And you're able to share some, some challenges, right? And some things y'all would do differently. What is a great win you had? Something that you kind of keep in the back of your mind and, and focus on and say, we need, and we can reiterate that, we can build that again, or that felt really good. And I'm even thinking about this now too. I would love to hear what you've done before. And maybe if y'all are dropping this in the chat too, um, I think you can share your wins as well. I think that's a great way. And then us to kind of think about or take a step back to even think about with COVID, right? How can we how can we translate that to a more virtual setting? Because we can't even worry about going to North Carolina or wherever now anymore, right? To some degree, there's some limitations. So, what are some good wins or strategies that you all have had? Yeah, yeah I have a, a kind of my turning point. I think as a, a fund developer was in 2013. I was brand new, just green behind the ears as an executive director for this national nonprofit. And the board of directors at, for that organization it was phenomenal, still is today. Um, and they had really laid the groundwork with this one particular uh, whale donor, is what we'll call him, right? Like big fish donor. But I had had a previous interaction with this particular uh, donor uh, through a former boss, and they did not do very well together. So I was concerned going into this meeting with, with this whale that I was going to be associated with this previous boss, right? And so I was a little anxious and I was supposed to make the ask as the executive director. So, you know, my uh, board vice chair at the time, I explained to her what was going on and she said, Kristen, just drop it and go in there and be yourself. Just tell them why you want to do this work, what's special about it and how they can help. And so I did that and we sat down and just basically shared our stories and connected heart to heart. She had lost a son to overdose. You know, I'm a person in long-term recovery and have been working with adolescents and young adults for a long time. Mm -hmm. And we just connected on that. And by the end of 45 minutes, when I asked her for $140,000, she was happy to give it to us. And so I think that that was a huge win because I was very anxious. And it was something I had to overcome, but really applied that whole just building the relationships and connecting the story to the organization. Yeah, yeah. I have a similar story. I was uh, here in Baltimore. I was going to be leading a, a big event and I wanted, I needed to, I needed a chair for the event. And see, that's the other thing. I, I needed a very high profile people, person from the community. And so there's a person here in Baltimore who's extremely well known. She runs one of the major hospital systems. And remember, I was at healthcare for the homeless. So this is healthcare. And so I really, um, I wanted to meet with her and she doesn't know me. So I had to first get in to her office. So I had to use my network, you know, someone knows someone. And uh, I got a meeting with her and I was also very nervous about, will she do this? And this is a big ask, you know, to run this event for the next year. And um, I just sat down and Chris and I pretty much did the same thing. I said, I've been working in homeless services for the last 15 years. This is something I'm passionate about. I really believe housing is, is justice, you know? And, and so she just immediately, she just said, I said, would you do this? She said, yes. And so I think a lot of times in our heads, we think that it's not gonna work and stuff. And it kind of goes back to my comment earlier, be okay with no. Because no may have nothing to do with you. It might be the circumstances in someone's life of what's going on with them. So that's the other side of the coin. Right. And I think on the back of it too, Lauren, I'm sure that y'all had this as well. We were able to prepare a budget and we had the makings, the beginning of a strategic plan. Part of our ask was also we wanted to use some of the funding to work with some money that is an expert with strategic planning, a consultant. And I think that that also helped with this particular donor because she really was interested in the outcomes and she wanted to see that her money was going to be invested well. And yeah. so having all of that along with the story and the connection, um, just eyeball to eyeball, person to person. And then of course the work that the board did. So it was sort of this perfect storm of everything, all the pieces fit together. We had a clear vision. We had our strategic planning piece. We had a budget protocol and the board really, knew their role and I knew my role. And so when that happens, that's when um, hopefully you get really favorable results. Mm -hmm. 
Fantastic. So we have one more question and time is almost coming to an end. So if you have any last minute questions, please mm -hmm. add them. Um, how would you approach developing sponsorship ads if you don't currently have a program or relationships established? Yeah. Yeah, that's from yeah. Johanna. It's good to see you. Another one of our good friends. <laughs> or do you want to take that one? Well, I have, I, so, uh, you know, this is something, um, in fact, that I'm dealing with right now. I'm, I'm on the board of a small not for profit. And um, we are looking at our fund development plan and thinking about how can we engage uh, in this community. It's Constellation Energy, is the one I'm trying to engage. It's um, like Baltimore Gas Electric's parent company. Um, and of course, there's Under Armour, which many of you probably know is here in Baltimore, Kevin Plank and Gang. So the, the way to get them is what I talked to before. Who knows someone over there? It's really, what is that old line, six degrees of separation from um, Kevin Bacon? It's that same thing. It's like you need to say to the people you know, it could be you're at a friend's house. Well, maybe not in, right now, but you're talking to friends, you're you're playing the Zoom game together on Zoom game night on a Saturday night. You just say, do you know anybody else? That's where it starts. That's how you can get the sponsorships because then you, because you can get in the door. They could send an email and say, I want to introduce you. Kevin, I want to introduce you to my friend, Lori Gillis. She's working with so-and-so and I know you really care about that. Yeah, and I mean, that's such a great point. We have an additional question here um, with Danielle about any success with a mail in annual campaign. And I, re I am a huge fan of annual campaigns after a first couple of years, right? So it takes a little while to sort of train people, especially we're moving into the end of the year annual giving. Um, so I think just like what Laura was saying, if you know somebody that knows someone, you will get better outcomes. Uh, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll have a better return on your investment. But I also just am constantly throwing it out there. if you know, if people are looking to donate or if there's any opportunity for a connection, I, you know, my family members actually hate to see me coming for Thanksgiving. <laughs> because that's usually when I'm telling them about, you know, my nonprofits that I hold near and dear, and I will hit them up <laughs> at Thanksgiving. Um, but yeah, so the annual campaigns I think are great. Also, there's um, corporate annual giving and, um, collegiate annual giving. There's a lot of different ways you could get your organization on one of those lists and then just work, you know, within the company, within your um, contacts to make sure that everybody understands that mm -hmm. your organization is on that corporate giving list for this year. Um, and just kind of, again, smoothing, networking, charming, whatever you want to call it, to make sure that they select you out of all of the many different organizations that are on that list. Yep. Thank you, that was fantastic. So I just wanna remind everyone, um, the purpose of this Power Hour is just to give you a little tip of the iceberg. I don't even think that was a tip, that was just like a shaving off the iceberg. <laughs> Um, and know that C4 has the capacity to really meet your needs and help support you. If you want to dive deeper into this work, please utilize the contact information um, that you're seeing to connect more with us. But um, Kristen, do you have any final words or anything before you have to hop off? Yeah, actually, just real quick. I saw, I think, in the participant uh, boxes that we do have somebody from Salvation Army. And I just wanted to give y'all a shout out because I love your messaging this year during COVID. If you haven't seen the commercials, go check it out. It's on their website. I thought it was very smart. Help rescue Christmas, which who doesn't want to rescue Christmas and give with a monthly donation of $25. That messaging was brilliant. So yeah. um, if you're looking for examples of pulling at heartstrings this year with COVID, uh, it's a really great one. Yes, it is. And Laura, do you have anything for the whole of the group? Well, I just want you all to know that I'm, I'm going to stay after Kristen has to hop off to go to another um, another webinar, quite frankly. And so I'm gonna stay here, and if you want to ask me questions, I, if I can help, that'd be great. We can uh, turn on your um, video and your audio, and we can talk. Awesome, and so can you just go back to that last slide? So our next Power Hour will be on racial equity and inclusion. I'll be leading that with another colleague of ours. It's November 18th from two to three. And check out for registration at c4innovations.com. And this is where you can connect with us, get the Power Hour recordings, um, 
talk about more consulting services we can provide and stay up to date. Yep. And just so you all know, we do, um, uh, we do consulting services all the time around organizational development. So strategic planning, fund development, talent management. So feel free to contact us. <laughs>